Let me see this one.
want to say check? Check, check. Yeah, it works. Check, check, check. <laughs> check, check. <laughs>
Yeah, there's another mic. So two there, two. Make sure the one thing with this mic is you don't have to place the other one wherever you bring it. Oh, I'm, I you don't, I'll stand on the side. Oh. All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Uh, thank you to those of you who are here in attendance in person. Thank you to those watching live on Facebook or social media right now, and thank you to everyone who might see this later once it's uploaded. Um, so welcome to the second town hall of the 2018-2019 year for the 76 SLC. Um, this is hopefully going to be a great opportunity for us to kind of speak more to what we've accomplished throughout this year, uh, as well as also give you updates on some things we've worked on, such as the Mac Hall consultation, as well as Bermuda Short Stay, which we know We've gotten a lot of great feedback on. Uh, so first, I'll pass it over to Nabila. Uh, thank you. Before we get started, uh, we'll just do a territorial acknowledgement. Uh, we would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy comprising of the Siksika, Pikani, Kainai First Nations, as well as the Tsutsina First Nations and the Stony Nakoda including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. Um, the City of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, and the University of Calgary is situated on um, land adjacent to where the Bow River meets the Elbow River, and the traditional Blackfoot name of this place is Mokinsis, uh, which we now call the City of Calgary. Thank you. Oh, and I forgot a part. Um, I also like to introduce uh, Jessica Revington, who is uh, the current vice president academic, but she's the incoming uh, president for the 77th Legislative Council. Amazing. Thank you so much, Nabila. And welcome to everybody. Uh, before we get started with, res uh, with the results of our annual plan, one thing that we want to do is actually take this opportunity to introduce the 77th uh, executive team to students here at the University of Calgary. So I'd like to invite my new executive team to join me on the stage. Um, Alicia Gordon, Omar Mansour, Saadi Nazir, and one of them is already up on stage with us, Kevin Dang. Um, so, as, as Nabila stated, I am the new incoming president for the 77th SLC. Um, I'm really excited to be, part of SL, to be part of the SU for another year. I've been with the SU for the past three years. Um, and one thing that I'm really excited to work on this year is actually working on a program called STRIDE, which looks to bring members of the Indigenous community, members of the LGBTQ community, and females into roles of leadership and into student government here on campus. Um, I'm going to pass the mic over to my fellow executives now so they can share at least one thing that they're excited about working on this year um, and tell you a little bit about one thing that they're actually really excited to bring to this campus. So we'll start with Kevin. I have a mic. All right. Hi everyone, my name is Kevin Ding. I'm your current VP Operations and Finance and I'll be the VP Academic for the 77th SLC. Uh, one thing that I'm really excited to work on and that has been worked on in the past is the Undergraduate Research Symposium. We saw a lot of growth this year with the uh, pilot of you know expanding it and adding all these new things to it. And I'm really excited to see it grow even more and uh, give students a really great opportunity to showcase their research, but also get involved in research as well. Thank you. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia Gordon. I'm the incoming Vice President Student Life. Um, I'm really, really excited to just jump into this role and uh, work on some of the amazing initiatives that already Nabila has started. I'm so excited about the new BSD and how we've transitioned, so I'm really excited. But um, one of my top priorities is definitely working with clubs. I've been really involved in clubs here on campus. Uh, we have FASA in the second row. <laughs> and um, just keep working to support clubs and uh, make the process a little bit more interactive. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Sadia Nazir. I'm the next incoming VP External. Uh, something I'm really excited about this year is our Get Out the Vote campaigns with the provincial and federal election, although I'll mostly be working on the federal uh, Get Out the Vote campaign, uh, really building connections with government officials afterwards and pushing our advocacy priorities. 
Uh, hi guys, uh, my name is Omar Mansour. I'm the current, or I'm the incoming Vice President of Operations of Finance. <laughs> I got a little too excited there for a second. Um, but yeah, I'm super excited to work on a couple of different things, but I think I'm really excited to work on policies with the SU. So I'm really excited to create a diversity and inclusion advocacy policy because I think that's so, so important on campus and just improve the processes within the Students' Union uh, currently as well. So super excited for that. Amazing. If you all want to join me in giving a hand to our brand new executive, they don't take office until May, uh, until May 3rd, um, but we're really excited to welcome them to the team. So thanks, guys. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to move into talking about the, uh, our annual operating plan. So the annual operating plan um, is something that each year the executives at the Students' Union put together. Um, and it's sort of a set of goals uh, that are based on our three key priorities at the Students' Union. Our annual plan is also based on our strategic plan, which we just renewed and we'll be talking about a little bit later today. Um, but as executives, we set goals that are based on three major priorities. So prior prioritizing advocacy, engaging with students, and in strengthening the organization. So once we have these three key priorities, we actually create goals that fall under each of these key priorities. And a lot of these goals will fall into various executive portfolios. And we also create tactics, which are actual measurable outcomes um, that will push us closer and closer towards actually achieving these goals and ultimately these three key tactics. Um, we'll be reporting to you over the next half hour, hour or so, what we've been able to accomplish over the past year as executives. That's actually awesome. I didn't know that was there. Uh, all right, so to make this a little easier to follow and a little bit more fun, uh, we, we put together a little bit of a legend to kind of outline our progress. So we have three emojis on the board right now. Uh, the first one with the sunglasses, uh, basically that indicates that the, you know, the tactic has been completed or ex expected to be completed. We still have a month left, so some things are still uh, going on. Um, the second one here, which is just a smiley face, is going to be transitioned. So these are things that there's a lot of progress being made, but will not be completed this year. They, they'll be transitioned onto the 77th executive. And the last one, uh, incomplete, which is this, um, I don't know how to describe that, but it's that weird awkward face at the, at the end. Uh, so that's incomplete. I'm happy actually to report and very thankful that uh, none of our goals are incomplete this year, which is great, meaning that we made progress in, in all areas, which is really awesome. And and I'll start us off. So uh, again, our um, annual plan is divided up into three big pillars. The first one is strengthening the organization. Uh, so under this tactic of ex assessing uh, our health and dental plan scope and also our current fee, uh, this is something that's still in progress. Uh, this year, uh, as I mentioned in our last uh, town hall, uh, we introduced a new fee payment model called the Rolling 12. Uh, this allowed students to get, uh, you know, a, a full year's coverage with one, just one payment, which, and, and also just kind of figure out some of the kinks with some of our other schools, like medicine and things like that. Um, we hope that this new fee payment model will allow us to create more sustainability with the health and dental plan without having to have an increase in the fee. Um, but we are still assessing the situation since it is our first, uh, you know, year with this new model. Uh, we will actually be meeting with our, uh, you know, Galvan Health and Dental, our, our health and dental providers, um, to talk about this and go over a year-end kind of assessment in the next few weeks here. So it's still in progress, but um, we will kind of get a better idea then. <clears throat> Moving on to the next one here. Uh, so this slide here is really focused around things like policy and uh, ensuring that um, the SU governance is a strong uh, point in our organization. Uh, the first tactic here is about advocacy policy. So this year, I had the pleasure of actually working with uh, VP Revington here on the uh, Open Educational Resources Advocacy Policy. It's a new way of uh, framing our ideas and our stance on OERs. And uh, with her help and our, our governance team, we've been able to approve that this year. Um, Jess, do you want to speak to that a little? Sure. So open educational resources are actually an incredibly important step for undergraduate students. They are affordable. They help students actually access the resources they need to be successful in their classrooms without the financial burden associated with textbooks. So it was really important to me this year that the SU actually create an open educational resource advocacy policy so that when we're talking to government, when we're talking to university administration, we have a stance on open educational resources that highlights just how important they are to students. And it was great to be able to work with VP Dang on this. Yeah, and in addition to that, we were, 
uh, we have a few other ideas or areas that we, we obviously advocate in we don't have policies for so things like um, you know working towards reconciliation that's something that's super important on campus um, that's something that we've been researching to make sure like okay what do other students unions do and how do they approach something like this and how does that work in their policies as well and governance so that's something else that we're looking into uh, obviously advocacy policies take a lot of research so uh, some of those other uh, areas and advocacy points um, are being looked at there as well Moving on to the next one, which is uh, accountability. Sagar, do you want to take that one? Absolutely. So uh, one of the key things to note is that our faculty representatives do get compensated for the great work uh, they do on campus in their faculties. Uh, so part of that is that they do receive bonuses for completing um, some great work at the SLC table, but also in their faculties. However, one thing that we lacked in previous years is some consistency on how bonuses were given out. Um, so one thing that the executives worked on this year was actually establishing a bonus rubric so faculty representatives have a better idea of what they have to do to get that bonus as well as make sure that we're more consistent with giving them out so our faculty reps are being compensated fairly. Awesome. So for the next one here, um, it really focuses on a certain procedure that we have, which is the committee uh, transparency procedure and uh, doing a review of all our terms of references. So again, this goes back to uh, the idea of strengthening our governance and our policies. Uh, so the idea around the committee transparency procedure that was introduced last year was to be that catch all so that things like access to minutes or access to meetings or when documents are sent out or duties of the chair or whatever it is um, are all caught in this one document. Unfortunately, there are some inconsistencies. So what we've done in our annual policy review is actually sit down with all the committee chairs, uh, I, coincidentally all the people on stage, um, and some of our staff to do a full review of this and to make sure that, okay, what are the inconsistencies? What are the areas that need improvement? Um, this has led us to um, look at things like the policy development and review policy, I know it's a mouthful, and also uh, this document as well uh, to ensure like, okay, what are ways that we can start to standardize things, make sure that we are consistent in not only our committees, but also our terms of reference and also all our other pieces of policy as well. So that's going to be a very long-term project, but I'm really happy to say that we have set the foundation for that consistent to be, or sorry, for consistency, consistency to be carried forward. Absolutely. And then under the last tactic, which is re reviewing SU governing documents, particularly the Constitution, uh, one thing we wanted to make sure was that our governing documents of your students' union are inclusive and kind of embody what our students on campus actually believe in. Um, so one thing that we wanted to do was make sure that, for example, we're using inclusive language uh, within these governing documents. Uh, so one thing that happened with this is that we were actually able to provide comments and feedback on all these policies as they are reviewed on an annual or every few year basis. Uh, however, this is transitioned as hopefully this will be coming to SLC as changes to the Constitution actually require a referendum, which all students will have a chance to vote on. So hopefully that happens in the coming year. So moving on to this goal, uh, which is all about Mac Hall. So the building that we're standing in now, your student center, um, a big priority of our team this year has been to look at, all right, so we've, we've gone through a Mac Hall dispute, we've finished the dispute, we have our rights in the building secure, what's that next step? And really, it's about building redevelopment, making sure that our space is the best that it can be. Uh, this year, Sagar and I have uh, worked hard to uh, do our, you know, our Mac Hall consultation. That was a survey that was conducted back in uh, September, October, around that time. I'm glad to say like that was completed successfully. We got a lot of good feedback from students, and I think it's something that will continue on moving forward obviously because needs of students are always changing. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on when we actually go into the survey results themselves. Um, but looking into uh, building plans and everything like that, Sagar? Absolutely, so under building plans, we actually were able to uh, look at some of the previous building plans which we've had, as well as make sure that those still address student needs. Um, with that, we did see actually some quality money submissions for the McEwen Student Center and McEwen Building to be improved. Uh, however, this is something we hope to transition. Uh, we believe that this year was probably not the best year for the students union to put money into a redevelopment uh, due to things such as the future of voluntary student unionism perhaps, uh, McEwen ballroom renovations, and a lot of other considerations. So with that, this is something that we look forward to passing on to Jessica and Omer in the coming year. And sorry, just to add to this, um, I think this year, again, it's setting that foundation for future execs to explore this. Uh, we took that first step this year in consulting and also obviously having those initial discussions with administration. Uh, but I think we have a we have a long way to go and a, this is just kind of the tip of the iceberg, so. 
Hey, moving on to more Mac Hall, yay. <laughs> so this one's all about building management. So a big part of the job now uh, has shifted towards not resolving a dispute, but more so about managing our space. Um, so thankfully this year, we've had something called the Joint Liaison Committee, or JLC, um, to you know, have a really solid platform where it's you know, myself, Sagar, our GM, and three representatives from the university, um, two from the executive leadership team, and, and one uh, third person. And uh, this has been a great platform for us to discuss issues around our space. So whether that's repair and maintenance, whether that's leasing, whether that's, I, I don't know, vendors, any issues that we may have, we can bring those up. And the great part about it is we're all decision makers around the room and we're able to make those changes and you know have impact right away and address any issues there may be. So glad that that's working out really well. And uh, for that second part here, I kind of touched on it. Uh, because we're introducing these new agreements, the MUSA, the SRA, our building agreements, um, you know, it's been definitely a challenge this year to make sure, all right, what are all the changes? What are the things that need to happen for us to manage the space? Um, it's a huge change from what we've done in the past, and this is our inaugural year in, as building managers. Um, and this year, I think we've done a lot of good work with getting everybody on board, making sure we're on the same page. We're even doing new things like, obviously, having tenant meetings with all of our tenants, doing tenant surveys, working with all the people that are in our spaces to make sure that, okay, these are our new agreements, this is what we gotta kinda live by and adhere to, um, and making sure we're you know, all up to speed. <laughs> More me, so going into sustainability. So um, under this tactic, again, sustainability has been a priority of the Students' Union for a while. We, haven't, we even have like an advocacy policy for it. Um, but this year, I think it was a huge priority for me to uh, work on things like this. So. Um, I think myself, some of our staff have done an internal review of a lot of our different practices to make sure like each department, whether it's catering, whether it's, you know, conference and events or the store or, you know, our businesses, um, we're making sure that we are being sustainable um, and ensuring that, you know, we are taking some steps. I'm actually in the process of compiling a report for that, so that will come hopefully in the next week to SLC. Um, and the second one here is all about waste management. So obviously we run a food court, right? Yeah, we're standing next to it. We're on the biggest producers of waste on campus uh, just because of, you know, packaging and things like that. Um, Want to make sure that we can minimize, minimize this the best that we can. Uh, waste diversion is one of the biggest issues, especially with like new four stream bins being introduced. Uh, we've actually put in a successful quality money application where we can introduce a new waste management system, which includes diversion tables. Like if you go to uh, Market Mall or the core or something like that, you'll see people sorting the, the different uh, waste bins and all that and standing there and manning those. Uh, but in addition to that, like composting, we, we're, going, we're going to get a new composter as well and a few other pieces of equipment that will help with that system. Awesome, so we're gonna move on to uh, engaging with students. Uh, and so kind of part of my, or a large part of my platform this year uh, was engaging with clubs, uh, whether it's operationally or through things like planning the club awards banquet, which is taking place tonight. Super exciting, if you're around, come to the Mac Hall AV um, area at 5.30. There will be some tickets at the door. It's free to attend um, and there's free food, so. Uh, but anyways, moving on. So one of the, my biggest goals was uh, for the SU to recognize the contributions that clubs put into um, our club system through recognition. So uh, with over 300 clubs on campus um, and with the club awards banquet coming up, there are uh, different awards that are given out during that evening. Um, and so one of my goals is to reevaluate and update the club awards um, criteria to better reflect fair eligibility. So this is something that happens um, through the clubs committee every year and we did take the feedback from last year's clubs committee into account when formulating the criteria for this year's awards um, and I just want to point out that this is something that um, will also be taking place next week during our final clubs committee meeting um, and those changes and feedback will be given um, for, for us to move forward for next year's um, awards criteria. The next one is introducing a new junior executive award to be given out at the banquet. That was completed. There will be an award given out tonight. Um, and I guess people liked it so much that we had a club on campus um, kind of reach out to us and say that they'd like to sponsor a second version of this award. So there will be two junior executive awards given out tonight. Um, the second one is sponsored by the U Calgary Baking Club. Um, 
Yeah, the last one is increased attendance at the club awards banquet. So this meant that switching, uh, we were going to switch it from a very formal kind of sit down style banquet to a cocktail style gala. Um, so it'll have a theme, it'll include food still and the awards, but it'll be at a different format for us to increase our capacity and allow for um, about 75 extra people to attend. Um, yeah. Amazing. So one of the things that was really important to me when I came into the role of VP Academic was making sure that students had the resources that they needed to succeed at critical points in the semester. So at the beginning of the semester, around midterm season and around final exams. So together, working with the Student Success Center, the Thrive Priority Support Network Officer, um, as well as the Academic Integrity Officer, we were actually able to create a list of over 25 different classes on campus that either use things like the PASS program or students have identified as being particularly challenging but are requirements for graduation and multiple degree programs. So what we were able to do is actually get resources out to at least 10 of those classes and do class talks in 10 of those classes to make sure that students were actually getting information about resources, academic support on campus at key points during the semester. One of the things that we realized, and a lot of my points will be transitioning over to Kevin as a 77th VP academic, is that there are far more classes on campus that need this type of support, that need either resources posted on the D2L site, need class talks, for students to realize that there are academic resources available to them on campus, or to be reminded of academic resources on campus during key points during the semester. So next up, one of the things that we want to focus on is also make sure that the campus community is more aware of the things the SU does for them. Um, and so one of the ways we wanted to do this was by hosting two town halls. Um, this is the second of which, so I'm glad to say this is now complete. Uh, but the big idea around this is that the SU hadn't held a town hall in approximately 10 years. Um, however, we see the town hall as hopefully a great opportunity to showcase um, the things that the executives are working on because we believe students should know what their executives are doing as they are elected officials in these roles and it is student dollars going towards the SU to help it function. Another thing that we focused on is actually something that I think all four of us kind of appreciate as former faculty representatives is that we need to make sure that we're recognizing the faculty reps that we have because they do some great things for our campus. Um, so one thing is that we did originally look into outlining their goals for the upcoming year through an annual plan sort of document. We actually changed this goal to actually include faculty rep accomplishments and highlights in our new, uh, in our new community report, which will be released upcoming over the spring, summer months. So hopefully this can be a way of communicating to the students on campus and the campus community what their faculty reps did for them over their last term. All right, so this next, yes, I do have a point under engage with students and it's all focused around the refugee student program and the refugee student board. Uh, so this year, um, we had kind of two kind of tactics under this goal. First one is all about uh, a new agreement with the university. The university is a huge stakeholder in that program. They contribute a lot to it, including things like residents and things like that. Uh, so we're at, our current agreement is expiring, so we are hoping to finalize that for this year. Um, so I expect that to be finished actually in the next little while. So I'm really excited for that and really to uh, secure the future of that program. Um, <clears throat> as for the second tactic here, which is all about outlining responsibilities and including our upper year students, we actually went through a huge rehaul of the um, refugee student board this year, one of our committees. And um, yeah, we've included more students at large. We've really added more responsibility to that group and ensuring that they have an active role in engaging with our refugee students and supporting them throughout their uh, you know, um, start here in Canada and at the University of Calgary. Um, I'm really excited to see where that program is going to go. I think we've, again, have a good structure and framework set up for that. And I'm really excited to see where Omer and Saudi will be taking that in the future. Um, and yeah, also, the upper year students have been fantastic. They've, um, you know, they've been in the program for a few years now. And they really offer that mentorship and some advice to the younger year students. And I'm, I'm really excited to incorporate that in, in, in this process as well. So most of my points under engage with students at this point have to do with URS or the annual undergraduate research symposium that the SU puts on. So actually a lot of these tactics were completed in the previous semester and we reported on them at the previous town hall. Um, but it was really exciting to see URS undergo a major transformation this year, particularly with the three-day structure and the inclusion of things like workshops, different types of presentations, 
oral presentations, displays, and posters. Um, we were also able to develop a new modernized URS mandate. The full mandate is actually available on our website if you're interested in reading it. Um, but I'm really excited about this mandate because it actually shows a vision for URS over the next several years and continues to encourage URS to grow and to, and to develop into what will hopefully be one of the premier research symposiums here on campus. Finally, one of the other things that I wanted to do with URS that I wasn't quite able to finish this year was actually creating some type of research resource to get students involved in research or to provide them with information about how to get involved in research. So right now, all of the information that would go into an infographic has been compiled and I will be passing that on to my successor, Kevin, as a 77th VP academic, to actually put that resource together and actually publish that infographic during the 2019 Undergraduate Research Symposium. I love the club system so much that I have a couple more points under it. Um, so the first one is uh, increase the club's budget by $10,000 from $50,000 to $60,000. Um, so that was completed for this year and it will, uh, there, the increase will also carry over till next year. After next year, um, there will be a sponsorship agreement that covers funding for clubs as well. So uh, we can rest assured that this um, is sustainable. And the funds have been uh, allocated aside for special event funding as well as last minute special event funding. Um, that's just to encourage clubs to host more events, engage more students, and apply for funding that they can use. Um, the next one is advocate to the university for um, increased free club spaces and services. So uh, there have been initial meetings with the conference and events management center at the university as well as um, lots of relationship building there. However, at the beginning of this year, they were migrating over to a new software. So they were unable to increase their capacity for free bookings for clubs. Um, but I... Um, made it my point to follow up with this at the end of the year. So there is a meeting that will be scheduled towards the end of this month to discuss this and negotiate it for next year so that clubs have uh, more free classrooms uh, that they can meet in or host events in. Absolutely. And next, uh, moving on to the Vice President External, who unfortunately couldn't be here, so I'll be reporting on the VP External's uh, goals and updates. Uh, so one thing I've been working on this year is engaging with students through out-of-office initiatives, um, and that is talking to students about some of the advocacy we do at the municipal, provincial, and federal levels. Uh, what does that mean? And getting some feedback on how do students feel about these priorities. Uh, so one thing we're glad to report is that Anaya will hopefully reach her goal of talking to 1,000 students uh, since she began her term on out-of-office initiative engagement opportunities. Awesome. So this is another point under Engage with Students that I am still really passionate about, and this involves actually reaching out to different groups on campus and consulting with them about the academic challenges that they face specifically within their departments or within their faculties. So we were able to reach out to a number of different groups on campus and consult with them. However, consultation is still ongoing, and this is something that I will also be transitioning to Kevin as a 77th VP academic to keep going because I do think it is important to actually reach out to different faculties, different faculty associations like FASA, three execs sitting in the front row, um, just to, to understand what types of academic challenges they face because the challenges that art students will face are likely very, very different or they could be very similar to, to challenges that students in the Faculty of Science will face. Next up is um, one of my biggest priorities this year, so mental health um, and making sure that mental health continues to be prioritized through our different programs. So uh, one of my goals this year was to implement monthly mental health workshops that give students the opportunity to de-stress as well as learn um, from a speaker about a certain topic that can kind of uh, relate to mental health. So I'm happy to say that these workshops were hosted and there were different collaborations across the university. So there was a collaboration with the Faith and Spirituality Center, uh, SU Wellness Center, as well as other areas. Um, and that attendance was um, substantial all throughout. Uh, we did have a little bit of trouble at the beginning of the year, but it's always a learning curve um, to change up locations, timings, uh, that sort of thing in order to get the attendance that we need. The next one was uh, hosting a stigma reduction workshop that's open to faculty, staff, and students on campus, which also took place um, last week, and that featured uh, Andrew Zito, who's the director of the Mental Health Strategy, in order to... Um, talk about it to our audience as well as how to engage with the strategy. And there was a student panel as well, so this was a very successful workshop. Great, so uh, one thing the SU really wanted to focus and work on this year is that um, we acknowledge that we also have a journey of truth and reconciliation as a student student ourselves. Uh, one thing we wanted to make sure that we did 
um, was to better equip our SLC elected officials um, with more education, more knowledge to be able to better represent Indigenous students on campus. Uh, so one of the first steps we took was as a part of our SLC orientation process, um, the first thing we did on our retreat was actually a blanket exercise um, to help SLC better understand the intergenerational trauma and the effects of residential schools so we can better represent hopefully Indigenous students on our campus. As we know, that's a group that we um, currently need to do a better job of advocating on behalf of. Jess, do you want to start on this one? or? So one of the things that's incredibly important for faculty representatives to know, as well as Sagar and myself, um, are our responsibilities to general faculty's council. So at least one representative from every single faculty, as well as Sagar and I, sit on general faculty's council or GFC. And this is actually a mandatory part of an elected official's roles and responsibilities. So one of the things that we wanted to do this year is actually create an attendance policy for GFC that aligns with updated bylaws that GFC passed earlier on during the academic year. Um, this is still in progress, mostly because we're looking at other institutions and ways that they hold their reps accountable um, in terms of attending GFC so that we can continue to hold our reps to the highest standard accountable or the highest standard possible um, and have them be accountable for things like GFC which actually are a part of their roles and responsibilities. And uh, just to expand on that, the second tactic here which talks about all these other university bodies, uh, it's kind of in the same, uh, I guess, lane here where it's uh, all about representing students and ensuring that we have student representation of all these different bodies. Um, again, it's this is a huge change, or it could be a huge change in how we fill vacancies or how we deal with, you know, like absences and things like that. We want to make sure that, again, people are being accountable, and two, um, we're ensuring that student interests are being represented in all of these. So we're doing our due diligence and doing our research in this area uh, to see how other institutions do it first uh, before we make some big changes of our own. So moving on to the VP Externals portfolio in terms of get out the vote. Um, so one thing that we will be focusing on for the remainder of this term is the provincial election which is coming up. So the VP External has been planning and executing a get out the vote campaign uh, with the goal of receiving at least 6,000 pledges for the provincial election, uh, which will also be raised actually for the federal election which is happening hopefully around October. Um, so with this, we do expect that Anaya will be able to reach her goal as we have a lot of more engagement opportunities coming up in the next week or so. Um, another thing is engaging with pro provincial election candidates uh, to talk about student priorities. So this is one thing that we realize we have to do a better job of is speaking to candidates so that they can better understand what are top priorities for students to begin with. Um, some of them may have not gone to post-secondary or may have not gone to university or have been so far removed uh, that it's a huge step in at least educating them on what are the key issues that they need to look to address. And last but not least, uh, one thing that Anaya will be working on is with Sadia on transitioning the best practices from this provincial get out the vote for the upcoming federal get out the vote as well. So there are two main issues during my term as VP Academic that I really wanted to make sure were addressed by university administration, and those two issues are the development and implementation of a new academic appeals structure, as well as statutory declarations. So both of these initiatives, um, there has been an information campaign that has been circulated with academic appeals. So far, we've heard from the university that it has gone relatively smoothly. Kevin Dang will be receiving a report after the first year of the academic appeal um, implementation, so we can see how it, the structure has actually worked and whether or not it's actually benefited students. So far, anecdotally, we feel that it has, um, but we want to wait for that report to be sure. When it comes to statutory declarations, we know that just out of the Enrollment Services Office, there have been multiple students that have been able to access statutory declarations, and we're really happy to see these numbers because it is a much more affordable alternative to providing a medical note, and it also gives students a lot more autonomy when it comes to deferring exams, term work, etc. The next part of this actual initiative, though, will be during Kevin's year, where we actually look at a way to implement information and discussion about statutory declarations in course outlines because students need to have that information at the beginning of the term so that when they need it they know where to go and they know how to access it. Finally, when it comes to advocating for support for programs like PASS, like Centralized Math Support and the Student Success Centre, this will also be conversations that Kevin will continue to have next year. One thing that we actually were able to do this year is provide a short-term funding, um, short funding for PASS through quality money this year, which helps that program find alternative sources of funding and help them 
continue to provide uh, continue to provide services to students. It'll be really important, though, that the, we continue to push to the university that these programs are important. Students need them. Students use them, and the university should therefore be putting more emphasis on being able to fund them. Another one of my big priorities this year was sexual violence prevention on campus. So one of my goals was uh, to advocate through uh, committee discussions as well as one-on-one -on -one meetings with um, university administrators the importance to have funds allocated uh, to set up a sexual violence prevention program or dating violence prevention program as well. So um, there has been a lot of relationship building just like I mentioned um, and although that the money hasn't been allocated this year, uh, this is definitely a priority that the university understands um, as well as there was an announcement made in February that the University of Calgary will receive a $1.2 million grant towards a um, dating violence prevention program, which is wise guys. Um, so although it is not current university money, this is something that um, the university prioritizes and will build on. All right, so last but not least for the annual plan, um, one last thing was to ensure that student priorities were something that were top of mind for the next president of the University of Calgary, and I think this is something that we can report on as complete. Um, earlier this year, President Ed McCauley was appointed from his position as Vice President of Research of the University to President of the University of Calgary, and I think um, Ed has really demonstrated that he has a great sense of the importance of understanding student priorities on this campus. And I think he's demonstrated that through some of the things such as conversations on campus uh, in a bunch of different faculties, which we've really been trying to push students to get out to and engage with because uh, hopefully this is our chance to demonstrate what student priorities are and what the president can now do to better address those in the future. So moving on, the Students' Union Strategic Plan for 2019 to 2022. So aside from our annual plan, one of the things that we got the pleasure to work on this year is that we were a part of the SLC, which reviewed our strategic plan for the Students' Union. So the strategic plan is a document which includes a vision, mission, and values. And so with that, it is a document that hopefully guides everything we do as an organization, and it's renewed and redrafted every three years. Uh, so we were very fortunate to be in the year where we actually got to write a new strategic plan for the organization. So earlier this year, we spent a lot of time going through data, going through consultation feedback, and drafting this new plan, um, which includes a revised and brand new mission, vision, and values for the 77th, 78th, and 79th SLCs, where it will then be revisited as well. So we are proud to present to you um, your Students' Union brand new strategic plan. So this starts off with uh, the Students' Union's vision, and this is kind of what we are trying to work towards, um, what our goals are. So uh, our, our vision for the next three years is that the Students' Union envisions a vibrant community where students thrive and are empowered to shape their unique university experience. We foster a culture of collaboration, trust, and respect that values the student voice. Together, we have both an immediate and lasting impact on students, the university, and the surrounding community. So this really looks different um, across all of our different platforms. So for example, advocacy is really important to all of us, whether that's through committee meetings, um, whether that's to the government. But I think for one of the examples for me is um, collaboration. So a huge example of that is the club system and encouraging clubs to um, get together, enc encouraging clubs to have a unique mandate um, and host different events on campus. And so that has kind of embodied uh, our goal of collaboration. Thank you, Nubila. And I guess the next part of our strategic plan is our mission. So our mission statement, think about it like if vision is what we're working towards, our mission is a step down, it's more nitty gritty, it's more about ice action, things that we want to work on. So I'll, I'll just read it out. Uh, so we serve to enrich the student experience by providing exceptional programs and services. We represent the voices of undergraduates through meaningful engagement, consultation, and advocacy. We support the diverse needs of students, community, or sorry, we support the diverse needs of the university community by embracing inclusivity and accessibility. So again, like Nabila said, this is a little bit high level, but it can be applied. It's done that so that it can be applied in a bunch of different ways. So from programs and services, like the different events we put on, things like pet therapy or even clubs, and that is a program um, to advocacy and what soccer does and our VP externals and um, you know, like all the different people that do that work. So it can really be applied in a broad sense. 
And finally, our values. So when we were creating our strategic plan, we had a really hard time coming up with only a few values because there are so many that we want to embody on a daily basis in our work and in our portfolios. But we felt that these five were the best representation of the values that we hope to embody on a daily basis when we're representing students, when we're working with the external community, and when we're working with administration. So accountability, we aim to achieve transparency in our procedures and conduct meaningful consultation through good governance. Inclusivity, we celebrate, support, and embrace diversity in all of its forms to build a welcoming student community. Innovation, we strive to adapt to the changing needs of students in creative and dynamic ways. Integrity, so we exemplify honesty and responsibility in all of our actions and decisions. And finally, leadership. We aspire to demonstrate and cultivate an environment of excellence. All of these values are something that we are, all these values are values that we believe are incredibly important for us to embody on a regular basis in our work. And we're very, very proud to present to you with our strategic plan. And last but not least, the key priorities are also something that we revisit every three years with the strategic plan. Uh, so we actually decide not to change the key priorities from the previous uh, STRAP plan. And so those will remain as strengthen the organization, engage with students, and prioritize advocacy. Uh, we believe these three key priorities are things that we should be accomplishing in everything we do. Uh, we need to make sure we have a strong SU for our students. We need to make sure that we're representing them as best we can. And we need to make sure that we're engaging with our constituents through everything um, and as much as possible. So next, we'll move on to the Mac Hall survey and an update on the results from that. Uh, so we'll quickly jump into this. So just for some background, the Mac Hall survey was administered online uh, for three weeks um, during September from the 6th to the 27th. We got 4,109 responses. Um, in comparison, the 2018 annual SU survey only got 1,358. So overall, this is a great success in terms of the turnout for survey responses. Um, we also gave away some prizing, including 150 Mac Hall vouchers for $10, five $100 Amazon gift cards, and one $500 flight voucher. All right, so uh, looking at the demographics, uh, you can kind of see um, you know, a little breakdown or an idea of who's, who's de uh, whose voices or opinions or thoughts uh, you're looking at. So obviously, you can see sex, age, uh, your relationship to the university, and the year program. Just to highlight one thing, the majority of our responses, as you can see at the bottom left here, are undergraduates. So this is very representative of undergraduate perspectives versus like graduate students, staff, faculty, that sort of thing. And uh, as you can see, we also have a big spread of um, you know, you know, what year the, the students are in um, with, uh, I guess, a majority to uh, first years uh, as we did run this through orientation days as well. So moving on for faculty demographics, we are actually very happy to report that we got re uh, responses from every single faculty on campus. And as you can see, um, in orange is the Mac Hall expansion survey data for faculty representation, and in blue is the actual student enrollment for 20, from 2017 to 2018. Uh, so we were actually really glad to see that our faculty breakdown was actually pretty similar to our student enrollment, um, which hopefully provided us with some more accurate results to better represent students. So. Obviously, the big question that we asked, and I'll, I'll kind of expand on some of the others that we, um, we talked about in the survey, but the biggest question that we asked students was, is it time to update Mac Hall or, or expand it? And as you can see by the, the pie chart here, 66% of responses say yes. Yes, it is. Um, and I guess in addition to other questions that we asked, like we talked about, well, what do students use Mac Hall for? Like, what's your primary purpose? The big one being food. Um, and then a secondary one, I think, being study space as well. Um, but we looked into things like, all right, so what are, what are different purposes you use Mac Hall for? How can they be improved? What areas would you like to be improved? Those are kind of the two big ones that I just talked about. Uh, but the big question is this, which is, is it time and the, the results say 66% say yes. So with that, um, and looking at that feedback, we did explore redevelopment this year. Um, so unfortunately, we did learn that the university is not currently interested in pursuing an expansion at this time. Um, some of the reasons included finances being a big consideration. Uh, one thing is also lights on funding. So lights on funding is a sum of money that you would receive from the provincial government to essentially operate your building. Um, this is often pretty common with buildings that don't actually generate revenue. Um, so something like a student center 
Um, if not for revenue generating spaces, which again is one of the reasons listed, um, they would have to get some sort of funding to ensure that that building is operating as otherwise those would come out of the university's pockets. Um, so considering this feedback, the SE will reconsider redevelopment and expansion in the future. Um, so some of the considerations we gave to this was our new role as building manager to look at this is our first year in this new role. Um, so what do the finances look like coming back to us and what will that and how will that impact our finances as an organization? Um, as you all may know, the ballroom redevelopment is currently ongoing. That is a multi-million dollar project. Uh, so we'd like to get that one off our plate first uh, before pursuing another major redevelopment or expansion. And last but not least, looking at redevelopment opportunities in our SU spaces. Uh, so a good example is projects like the clubs areas or speaker's corner or the den which have all been previously renovated and, and essentially redeveloped to hopefully better meet the needs of students and modernize them as well. I think just to add to this, um, like obviously Sagar and I, like after the Mac Hall dispute was resolved last year, I think, well, we were both running at the time um, for, for our current positions, um, but this is really the first step in looking at a redevelopment, having those initial discussions, putting on a survey for that first time in I think four years, five years? Five years, yeah. The last one was in 2013, I believe, um, I think, or 2014. Um, so I think this is our first step in, in a long process here. Uh, and I'm really proud of uh, Sagar and his work in this as well, just to kind of kickstart that. OK, so we're going <laughs> to. We're going to get into uh, a little bit of an overview on Bermuda Shorts Day. Um, so. This is pretty fun. I'm excited. So Bermuda Shorts Day will be in its 59th year this year, um, and it's courtesy of your students' union. Just a little bit breakdown of the numbers. As you can see over here, um, the sales in comparison, like if we're, for example, comparing sales from 2016 to 2018, uh, sales in 2016 were $67,000, whereas sales in 2018 were $29,000. So this continues to show us that students are drinking less and less at the event, um, as well as the attendance uh, has also been going down. Last year, with our, even with our consideration to charge students uh, their entry to BSD, we still ended up losing over $98,000. Um, and the highest costs for the event were things like facilities, so the fencing, the porta potties, um, security, and the costs that are being paid out to parking services, so the parking lot, traffic services, and scanning of student IDs. That was great, wasn't it? <laughs> so building on Nabila's points, um, those factors have contributed to the trend of rising costs and decreasing revenues at Bermuda Shorts Day. Um, so since 1989, the SU has always shouldered the cost of BSD. And as you can see, from 2002 to 2007, it was actually held right behind us in the TFDL quad. In 2008, however, we got snowed out, and the event actually did have to get moved indoors, which is why you can see that the cost and the revenue and expenses were so much lower. After that, in 2009, the construction of TFDL actually meant that the university insisted BSD be moved to Lot 32, where it's been taking place for a number of years. But as you can see, the red bars, which are the expenses, have consistently gone up since 2009 um, on a general trend, and revenue has continued to decrease. Um, so with this, this has been a huge consideration for the financial sustainability of a tradition that has been going on for so long that we really don't want to see go away. And I just want to add, um, so before we get into our issues addressed, um, in our SU survey in 2013, BSD was uh, the most popular event that the SU organized. So over 70% of students say, said that they were planning on attending. Whereas in 2018, only 46.8% student, uh, of students uh, plan to attend. So this really reflects the drastic decrease in um, popularity and student engagement in our event. Um, and this is kind of what led us to some of the changes that we'll be talking about. So the first uh, few changes was, uh, or were the fact that the food court will remain open um, on BSD. Sorry, <laughs> my mic is pushing pages. Yeah, so the McEwen building will remain open, so there, that no longer um, kind of hinders the operations of the food court. It'll be open for the whole day. Um, and we will also have more food options available at our event for a uh, decreased price. So this will be courtesy of the den, so we can ensure that they're student-friendly prices uh, in comparison to things like food trucks, as well as Jugo Juice will be open in the area to accommodate for um, other types of dietary restrictions. 
Um, we'll also have diverse musical performances, so uh, there will be in different venues. We'll have someone at the Mac Hall concert area, someone at the Black La a Den, and someone at the Black Lounge. Um, so you'll be able to flow between these different areas with different musical talents all at the same time. Um, and we'll also be offering a bigger variety of drinks uh, with full service bars that will provide you greater choice, but at den prices as well. Um, so you can <laughs> say goodbye to the Twisted Teas and you'll have a lot more um, availability and opportunities for different <laughs> types of drinks. Oh, uh, we'll also have different opportunities for you to have a great time at BSD, even if you don't engage in drinking. So there will be a photo booth, there will be some karaoke, there will be lots of giveaways. So um, we encourage you to come early. And these are just some of the ways that we can reinvigorate student interest in BSD. Like I mentioned before, um, the interest has just declined over the years, and we were truly looking for different ways uh, to bring it back to the event. Absolutely. So along with these changes, we made sure to also go back to a free model. Um, so with this, there is no uh, longer a wristband fee uh, for your wristband pickup. Also, the event is no longer weather dependent, which is a big thing that we want to make sure that BSD is no longer at the mercy of if it snows, um, which if you check the weather last night, it's supposed to snow about five centimeters on Friday the 12th. Um, Further, uh, future construction impacts are also one thing we considered. So the area surrounding Lot 32 is one that will likely be impacted by the construction of new, um, essentially, facilities on the University of Calgary campus, such as Matheson Hall and the Interdisciplinary Science Innovation Center, um, which are all slated to go around that Lot 32 area, Matheson Hall actually going up in Lot 31. And last but not least, uh, we hope to do this to address the financial sustainability um, as we kind of mentioned earlier on, BSD is, is a tradition that we don't want to see go. Um, so hopefully this is a way of ensuring its longevity um, for the years to come. And so last but not least, we have a few SU announcements. So get out the vote uh, in order to pledge and win. So if you guys do pledge online or in person, you can actually win a number of prizes um, at a great value, such as flight vouchers or Mac or Apple products. Um, so one thing to note is that the writ has been dropped for the provincial election. Please get out to the polls, whether that's advanced polling or on election day, which is April 16th. We actually will have advanced polling here on campus in this very building, April 10th and 11th from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. in the Shirley Anastasia Robertson Lounge, which is right by the Black Lounge or Q Center. So please go there and vote on advanced polling. It's actually out of your exam schedule, hopefully, so that is easier to access. And you can also vote in any riding. So it doesn't actually matter if you live in Calgary Varsity or any riding in Alberta, you can vote on your home riding right here on campus. So you can go vote at the advanced polls and then you can come to BSD. Um, so you can pick up your free wristbands for BSD from April 8th to 11th. Um, there will be set up in the North Courtyard and we'll be here from 11 to 5. Um, like we mentioned before, wristbands uh, are free this year and you just need your student ID and government ID to pick one up and be a registered U Calgary student. And with that, we would just like to say thank you to all of you who are attending here in person, uh, those of you tuning in from social media or who may see this later on. I uh, really appreciate your attention today and hopefully you found this as an opportunity to better understand um, some of the stuff that we've been working on and an explanation of some of the decisions we made this year. Um, so with that, we are happy to take any questions you may have. We do have an audience mic. Um, if not, uh, we'll probably end this segment if we don't have any questions and just interact with people. Feel free to come up to us and talk to us more about anything we presented today because uh, we're happy to talk more about our initiatives. So thank you. Any questions? Oh yeah, you can yeah. Is this presentation available online or otherwise? Not available online, but I guess we are actually recording it right at the back, so it should be on social media, but, so sure. But like the slideshow and everything. Um, I can check and get back to you. Okay, that'd be yeah. awesome, Sager. Thank yeah, you. Of course, no problem. Any other questions? Is everyone coming to BSD then? Okay, good. <laughs> I see some head nods. Awesome. In that case, uh, we'll come down. Please grab more freezies, and we're happy to just talk about anything that we've been working on this year. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>